Today there are good things that are happening, and of course bad things that are happening in Somalia. Sort of like the, the Dickensian, the best of times and the worst of times. On one hand, uh, the biggest threat is kind of being pushed away, as Shabab. They're on the run, so to speak. There's still a threat, but at least something that nobody fathomed uh, a couple of months ago has happened. Uh, the other thing that's happening is one, one particular nation challenged the rest of the world to think differently with a different paradigm, and that's the country of Turkey. When they bypassed the system that was set up for the aid monies to go through and to process it through the Nairobi agencies and so forth and so on, and then trickle it down to the needy people. So this one country decided to bypass all of that, raised $500 million, and they brought their own people, put them on the ground. They're running feeding centers and clinics and all kinds of things, schools and, and so forth and so on. So they brought that different uh, paradigm. And they also challenged the rest of the world at a time when the people who were supposed to be providing the services were arguing that we cannot go there because it's too dangerous. Prime Minister and, a foreign minister and his foreign minister and their wives and kids visit there. And they brought their own people to start the operation right away. And they're functioning. As one report said, a friend of mine who came back, he said, it's sort of like McDonald's now. Their clinics are everywhere in Mogadishu. This was his response. So good things are happening. Of course, the negative thing is the perfect storm that we, talk, we hear about through media and all other places. The famine, the, the anarchy, the piracy, and, uh, violent extremism, and so forth and so on. And one, one of those can bring an entire nation down. But we have four different challenges in that respect, so you can understand. So we have both things happen. As I said earlier, if you bring people who are knowledgeable about the situation, they would not agree on what happened in Somalia. But I think you can sum it up with all the problems that people list, and mostly grievances uh, of various kinds. You can put them in three different categories, so to speak. One is internal injustices that took place, uh, organized internal injustices. The previous government, of course, did its share. Clans do their share. And the current administrations, to a certain degree, that were based on those grievances, to a certain degree, set up a system that's bound to commit the same thing that was committed against them. So internal injustices. The other, the other category is, of course, the category of international interference or Somalia being a geopolitical pawn that has been abused and exploited for decades. And still many people are involved under the whatever umbrella that they use. But the ultimate goal is even the so-called international community now have a diversion of an, uh, uh, interest that one pulls, the other one pushes, and so forth and so on, and they're not coherent. Because international community only works when there is a moral authority, and then there is a leadership. You know, one country takes over that and says, we are in charge of this. And in the case of Somalia, there, neither one exists. Although one can argue in the moral leadership today can be the famine and so forth and so on. Okay. After all, Somalia is not a rogue nation. It's not the current uh, government is not uh, abusing its own people and, 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 and killing them, imprisoning them, threatening them, and all of that. 
In fact, it stands for the opposite, with all its limitations and dysfunctionalities to a certain degree. We will discuss all of that. So in the issue of injustice, it's sort of like what Prophet Muhammad talked about, the double-decked boat. And in educating people metaphorically, he says, you, the enlightened people, the elite, the moral people who are in the upper deck of the ship, don't neglect those who are in the lower deck of the ship. Because when you deny them an access to water, ultimately one of them will say, maybe we should dig a hole so we can have the access to the water beneath us. And when they do that, everybody's at risk, sinking. So today, Somalia, in a nutshell, that's what was going on. People were denied certain rights. And what happened is, ultimately, we're paying the price collectively as a society and all of that. And then there is the third category, which is the leadership failure. And when I say leadership, I'm not talking about just in the, in the top elite, the government. Oftentimes, we turn our heads to the government when we talk about leadership. I'm talking about leadership in the collective sense. For societies don't exist without families, without communities, and so forth and so on. In every sector of Somalia, the leadership had failed. One caused the other or they all collapsed at one time, or one may argue it really did not exist after the uh, independence of the country. Because some of these sectors that were functional, the ones that were based in religion or hair and all of that, were really bypassed by the new formation of the new state. And the new state was based on a Western state. It really did not have anything inside. It was just a shell operated by few visionary nationalists who were driven by the uh, desire to liberate their country, but did not have a whole lot of thing after that. And when the political competition started within the leadership, who were running a movement at the time, and the movement was based on liberation, they start competing for political gains. And they became divided as a result, and the country never recovered in so many different ways. Of course, things got worse gradually and so forth. So with that in mind, how that context that I just gave you impacts governance, how does it impact security, how does it impact the humanity or the, the famine and so forth and so forth. By good governance, I mean the prevention of the abuse of the public resources for private gain or for clan gain or whatever the reason is. And then by establishing in institutions, civil societies, that guards you know, in these checks and balances system that the government sets up or at least allows to be set up afterwards. And then setting up policies to sustain that. So how does what we inherited as a free country, and these young visionaries who were nationalists, as I said, who, whose cause became politicized afterwards, became divided, and everybody turned and found, tried to find aid within his own clan system political support and what have you. Have they succeeded in building these institutions to sustain good governance? The simple answer is no. There were initial, initially some institutions that were built to sustain the uh, system, the education system, the health system, and all of that. But there weren't private entities that, uh, made checks and balances possible. So the government was basically running everything. 
So when you have a system like that, that was really having a lot of problems from the beginning and it never recovered since independence, so many challenges, so many foreign interference upon during the Cold War and during the 21st century competition for Africa resources and all of these other things that people drive them and Robert Kaplan and, and brilliantly describes how the 21st century is controlled by the people who control the waters of right there where the waters of the issue, where, where things are happening right now. Indian Ocean uh, and the Red Sea and so forth and so forth. Okay. So it's still a pond, in other words. So Mandekh became, Mandekh is the uh, symbol of the nation, a she camel, was it became something that uh, people just tried to find a way to milk it and to get things out of it rather than feeding it, nurturing it, caring for it, and so forth. So that became the norm. And the clans start competing for that accessibility. One of us has to be there in order to milk Mandak and just to steal it, loot, you know, loot whatever we can out of Mandak. And that became the tradition. So when clans are fighting, most of the time what they talk about is grievance that's politically based. We were denied access. That's the main source of the argument. Although in that uh, claim or dissension, it caused some people to suffer, of course. The military government were, was harsh on certain people for dissenting against the government. And so so that cannot be denied. But overall, though, Clans compete for accessibility. One of us has to be there. The same mentality that exists today. Why would one of, them, one of yours has to be in there? Not because he or she is qualified, not because he or she would be the best person for the nation, but he or she would be the best person for us. So we would have an access. So we would have an opportunity for nepotism and so forth and other means of uh, stealing and so forth. On the security, how much time do I have first before I do? Um, you have 15, minutes left. 15, good. So on the security issue, I'll just touch a few uh, historical dates, just like your school does. I, I, I uh, navigated your website, and one thing that caught my attention was these historical periods that your school lists. So when, at what, uh, what year, uh, at a time when your school did something worthy of remembering. And one of the things that really caught my attention was 2006, the day that the school shut down, closed, all, all classes were canceled because of Katrina. And the students had to discuss in ways of how to best get themselves involved or what can they do and all of that. That to me is what constitutes beneficial knowledge, ilm al you know, when an institution is not just teaching theory, it's teaching the practice aspect. So I commend uh, your institution's leadership for doing that. Now, going back to the, these important dates that impacted security, I would start with 1977, the war between Somalia and Ethiopia. And then immediately after that, what happens? And some of the soldiers, who, for one reason or another, and it's a lengthy, uh, but wanted to overthrow the government, and then the government was harsh in response. And therefore, their clans suffered, and so forth and so forth. So that particular period. And then, in 1988, when the government started going very hard against the people of the north, the northern part of Somalia, today is Somaliland. Again, because they dissented against the government, and that was an act not to be tolerated, basically. And then in 1991, after the, the implosion of the state, if you will, which lasted all the way to 2006, during that period, you had the Klan militia groups who initially overthrew the government, who were in agreement but did not really figure out what they want to do after the state collapses or the government. 
And then they had, they were divided and some of them start fighting among themselves and uh, intra-clan fightings and so forth and so on. Then was followed by the warlord era that we are very familiar with. And then the business lords, those who were benefiting from what the state used to run, you know, became wealthy. Uh, they were the profiteers, so to speak. And they enjoyed and they benefited from the status quo. Okay. And then there, was the, they, there came after that the religious lords, such as Al-Shabaab who are claiming that they are doing these things because, of, uh, because their religion instructs them or they want to uh, make the nation uh, Sharia compliant, if you will, you know, and so forth and so on. And then, of course, from 2006 actively, what I would call the ghost lords. Now, the ghost lords, we don't know how to define them. We just know that they're there. Okay? They sabotage every action. They come in so many different forms. Sometimes they're local, sometimes they're neighbors, sometimes they're international. But they're there. They impact the outcome of the situation. And there is a force that goes back and forth, back and forth and plays in every agreement. It fuels the, the, the powers that, to disagree with that agreement and so forth. And then in that process, of course, just to be reminded that Somalia became just like any other country in Africa, or at least we became the poster child of Africa's brain drain. Because during that time, all those who could flee fled the country. And they were never to look back. Because now it became a ground for internal fighting, Unless you were picking up the gun and joining one of those forces, you really did not have much to do. So most of the people came to diaspora, various countries, and settled in here and so forth. And then 2009 to present, good things were happening. And I want to emphasize the good things because of the bad things are often what we hear. And in order, we are, after all, in an institution, an institution of higher learning, so we have to put something on both sides of the scale. We cannot all be negative and not really talk about the positive things. One of the positive things that happened, thank you. One of the positive things that happened is, in fact, rebuilding of the national army or building the security apparatus of Somalia. Still, it's an ongoing process. But the way things are right now is totally different than the way things were before. Militias that are owned either by warlords or they were owned by a clan or what have you. And there were people who were really abusing the system, even claiming that they have soldiers, that they have to receive their salaries and so forth and so on. But those soldiers, if they were needed, and they were told to bring 100 of them, they could not. And they still received 2,000 members of his clan's salary. All of that was a stop. Now, the IC international community, and here's one of the areas where I blame personally, openly. Uh, through the funding that was really collected on behalf of Somalia, these soldiers were trained in different countries. Some groups were trained in Uganda, others in Ethiopia, and so forth and so on. And you can understand, in one particular country, the trainers were from Spain. And the trainees are Somali prospective soldiers, of course, who were to join the army. And the two are speaking two different languages, so they wanted to figure out who can communicate. So they hired one of the local soldiers to do the interpretation. And he goes, well, yes, I, am, I can speak Spanish, but I don't speak Somali. In addition to Spanish, I speak Swahili. So they brought a person who speaks Swahili and Somali to do the translation from Spanish to the 
second, and then explain it to the third party, so the fourth party can be trained. So you can understand how much is lost in translation and so forth. Well, all of that process is now being integrated, and that process is still ongoing. And now the command can function as one unit. And in fact, one of the things that's really functioning for them is that the, 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 uh, while the court system of the country has not yet been developed, the military courts are functioning. The people that are abusing others who are raping, they put them through the military court, process them through them, and show that the government is functioning, and sometimes we give them a stiff sentences to show that there is no tolerance for them. And those who are stealing the, uh, the, fa uh, the, uh, the foods that are donated for famine and so forth. So there are something good that's happening, and we can list them uh, later on. And then, of course, the last thing, you know, as far as the security is concerned, the most recent Kenyan incursion, which really uh, opened another debate and dialogue as to how can that really impact and how can that how might that boost the uh, Shabab's public appeal, if you will, something that they've been drastically losing you know, for the last at least several months. How much of that also impacts, we covered the governance, security, and now we're talking about the famine. Famine, first of all, is caused, at least in the case of Somalia, The long drought that everyone is familiar with, the worst in six decade, decades or seven. And then the Iron Fist of Al Shabaab, the areas that they control, of course, they denied any access uh, to, the, uh, to the people and so forth. And then the weak and, and I, to a certain degree dysfunctional central government that's not really uh, working in cohesion. And this is, this is a fact, and we have to state it as is. And then the fourth element is the IC politicizing the, uh, the, the donation or the famine and aid. All of that equals to what we see now as the Somali famine. I would want to continue if you tell me how much time I have. I don't want to. Another six minutes. Another six minutes. Good. So. The last part is answering the question as to how can we get out of this. Now we defined the problem, we talked about different period and so forth, how can we get out of this? And this is where we really need to do a lot of thinking. And not just one group is responsible for it, but everyone in every sector of the society is responsible for it, in my opinion. So the list that I give you is not just directed at the, what the government could do or what the outsiders could do, but collectively what we can do in so many different sectors. So I'll start with the trauma center approach. What do I mean by that? Well, look at Somalia as a country, as a, uh, Somalia as a country, the, the situation that it's in right now, as a patient that suffers from so many different illnesses. Okay, so many different illnesses. And you're the person, the doctor at the trauma center. And this patient is brought the patient is in coma, the patient is bleeding, the patient's heart is not working, the patient has ear infection, okay? Her, uh, the patient has uh, a bad case of cold, okay? And a patient got pocket full of money and maybe cell phone and what have you. And that person as he's brought in and you're the doctor, you see somebody putting his hand in that pocket, getting the cell phone or the wallet of that patient. In other words, they're stealing what's theirs. Do you worry about that? Or do you want to stop the blood? Or do you want to pump the heart? Or do you want to address the cancer issue and the, and, and the TB and whatever other illnesses that the patient has? Because some are definitely more urgent than the other. And if we get caught always discussing the minor things, we lose what's important. And for 20 years, we were circling around things that did not matter most. You know, who is there? Why is he there? You know, well, these people are controlling that. Why these people are not controlling that? Things that really did not matter if you really want to save the patient. 
because there's only one way to approach it, and that is to detach yourself from all of these other distractions and focus on what matters. Stop the bleeding, pump the heart, you know, figure something to really stabilize that patient. And then we can discuss about other things, who stole the wallet and why did they steal it and how can we recover it and, and so forth and so on. <clears throat> and then we need, of course, massive education to educate the public about the importance or the supremacy of the rule of law. You know, something that really for the last 20 years has been taken for granted. And then we need to professionalize the judicial system, which I mentioned, and I said that it's not really functioning. It's not up to par by any standard. So that has to be a priority, of course. And then cutting the IC, the international community, our relationship with them. I propose that openly and I'll repeat it. The way it's set up right now, it's not to the best of Somali, uh, uh, Somali uh, to recover as a, as, a, as a state. And the reason is very simple because every year, about $1 billion is donated towards Somali, every year. And it goes through various agencies, various networks that are set through Nairobi, and by the time it reaches, God knows what percentage reaches. But if you really want to figure out what percentage reach, reaches the people, look at the people. And look at the country, how it looks like. And then you will understand how much, how, what is the percentage that ultimately reaches the end receipt. Now, they are corrupted system and we cannot overhaul that corrupted system. So the best way to do is Somalia to have direct relationship, bilateral relationships such as with Turkey and other countries, US and other countries that are really trying to help them on a country to country basis, not putting the money through that process. And finding people that can deliver the work and can be held responsible and accountable when they lose some of these money or squander it around and so forth. And then what we need also is to calibrate our expectations. You know, there's something problematic that we have seen among us is people are just, when there is a new group that come in, the expectation is just slight. No one is thinking about that this problem was ruined for and happening for the last 20 years. And Somalia is a country that we really need to start from ground up. If you really want to understand conceptually how that, what is th that like, think of Haiti. Think of Haiti after the earthquake. When the system broke down, the whole country, and that was just one incident. Imagine Haiti after 20 years of having nothing, nothing functioning. You can bring the most brilliant people on the face of the earth, 1,000 of them, and giving them all the jobs that are available right now to run that operation, and come back three years later, they will have a list of things that they have not finished. And you can blame them easily. So the blame game and the high expectation that's irrational in so many different ways needs to be calibrated. I'll stop here respecting the signal that I was given. I got a few more suggestions, then I'll come back and cover them.